All right. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about information interfaces. We're going to be talking for the next couple of days about how do we present information and information technology to people in kind of a modern electronic environment. Um, so these are kind of what we're going to go over today. We're really interested in, you know, thinking through what is uh, information visualization, information graphics, and then on Thursday we're going to be talking much more about user interface design or user experience design, sometimes we call it. Basically both what are principles of good design for information objects, but also how do we test that, how do we do user testing. It should actually be quite a full day on Thursday. All right. So the central question that we're going to talk about for the next little bit is how do people understand information um, uh, that's available? We've talked a couple times about how there's this great wealth of information, how we have more and more information available. And a lot of that information, if we just look at the raw data stream, it's impossible to really interpret that information, right? So part of what we've done is we've developed tools to help us analyze and look at information. Uh, and to basically aggregate it into an understandable format that takes big data and turns it into analysis or information of a type, right? This is my favorite data, data visualization. This is how I like to see my infographics, right? So this is basically um, kind of a nested OLS regression with uh, information seeking on Facebook as a dependent variable and then a bunch of independent variables that predict basically the variance in the beta of our dependent variable. Any statistics nerds in the crowd? No? No statistics nerds? Oh, come on. So, so this is a really common, we've done this for decades, if not, you know, for uh, over 100 years. I've come up with, you know, more and more sophisticated statistics that allow us to interpret and to boil down, basically, big data to enable us to do some things. But these types of tools, like this particular model, uh, type of model, were invented and statistically created in an environment where we did not actually have that much information. It was expensive to collect data, and it, consequently we had really small data as opposed to big data. This is actually from one of my papers, by the way. One of my grad students had to work and make that. So there's a, there's a rich history uh, uh, over the past 150 years or so of scientists and especially social scientists looking at social data developing statistics that help us to take information and turn that into intelligence of some sort, right? Into some sort of outcome. Um, a good example of that, uh, this guy, Rensis Lickert is his name. Huzzah, Rensis! Uh, was um, uh, central to the formation of the Institute for Social Research, which, lucky for you guys, is right here at the University of Michigan. Rensis uh, worked basically uh, in World War II. He was a, a supplies officer, and, and World War II was kind of the first time we saw, in the United States at least, really massive scale organizing and the need for data. Like, I need, you know, 300 cans of, uh, or 300,000 cans of corned beef hash to get to Guam tomorrow, and I need to track my inventory, and I need to know how many bullets I have, and how many soldiers are going where. It was basically, for the United States, this really watershed moment of big data. Right? Our military forces were big data and we needed to track those. So Rensis and other social scientists working for those guys would develop quickly uh, measurements and scales and statistics that would help them to understand what were going on. And Rensis did a lot of methodological work when he got his PhD to think about, all right, how can we simplify this process? How can we collect better and better data? How can we use surveys more effectively? And he created something that is known as the Likert scale. Right? Has anybody ever heard of the Likert scale? It's basically so deeply embedded in our culture, it might as well be a hemorrhoid on the butt of America, right? It is that five question thing, right? If you answer any survey item, if you fulfill any Amazon review, if you vote on anything, you are using work that's based off what Rensis Lickert did, you know, uh, 60 to 80 years ago now. Uh, he basically took complicated social phenomenon and was able to show that, well, it's a little reductionist, but we can boil this down to this five or seven item scale and get pretty good information about what people think or feel and do. Uh, so he was uh, uh, insta or instrumental in founding the Institute for so Social Research, and now ISR, as they call it, is a world leader in collecting data from the population, right? What ISR does each and every day is collect great, uh, expensive, <laughs> high-class data about what do Americans think, who are we going to vote for, 
how are we doing economically? You know, the, the uh, consumer confidence index is run out of theirs. Like, how do Americans feel about the economy? What should we do about unemployment? All of that stuff is all mostly big data that we collect and then we analyze and turn into intelligence. There's a longer history uh, that goes into some of these statistics. And, and remember we talked about with Weinberger's article how statistics related to information about the state, right? And how once industrialized society came out that we would have to really figure out um, how to collect the state and make sense of it. One of the guys who grew up around that time was Sir Francis Galton. Um, you know, definitely kind of English Victorian era class. Huzzah! Oh, Sir Francis Galton. He actually invented regression analysis, correlation analysis. He came up with the term regression towards the mean. Uh, he was a mathematical and statistical genius. He invented so many statistical methods and questionnaires and surveys that we still use today to measure the health and wealth of our society that it's remarkable, right? He was undeniably a genius and undeniably a racist, insane ass clown, right? Like amongst the many things he believed was the fact that you could measure a person's intelligence by the shape of their heads and the size of their heads, which many of you have heard of as phrenology in the past. And so he would go around measuring people of different races' heads. Like he would just walk up to you on the street with a caliper and measure your head and then like say, well, this person's, you know, uh, Eastern European. There's no way they can be of the intelligence of a native Englander, you know. Uh, so he believed that, so that was weird. Uh, he believed in social Darwinism, which is basically this idea that uh, poor people should be bred out of society. People are poor because there's something inherently <laughs> genetically wrong with them, and that the way to improve society is to only allow people to breed who were strong, you know, healthy, good-looking. You, know, you might recognize some of these, uh, that social Darwinism and some of Galton's work became instrumental to the Nazi party, like, you know, 60 years later. Not so cool. To, to fuel that particular hard on. Um, the other really fun thing he did is he had this idea of perfect physical beauty for women. So he would, on top of measuring people's skulls, go out and like measure boobs and stuff with his calipers as he was walking around London streets. But he was a rich, eccentric Englishman, so people just kind of let him do that. Weird. But for all that, for all that weird stuff, you know, just so to show that, you know, life is a complicated and rich tapestry. He really revolutionized how we think about information and how we analyze large sets of information and what it means to basically analyze through statistics uh, big sets of information. But, and this is, you know, this is not a stats class, so I'm going to leave it up to your stats classes to show you how that really works and the assumptions built into that. Uh, but what we're going to talk about more are information graphics and when information gets complicated enough or we feel that, you know, part of the problem with statistics is that you have to really be kind of fairly well trained in statistics to understand them. Uh, most of us will understand a mean, but you know, part of why people distrust or mistrust statistics so often is because they don't have adequate training to really get what people are getting out of them, right? So uh, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what statistics mean and that's why people don't trust them. Uh, consequently, a lot of times we turn to things like the uh, uh, information visualization to be able to show what statistics can't show us because they're too complicated or we don't really want to trust them. Ah, oh, you woke up, damn it. I almost had the photo. I'll leave this right here just in case. You still look sleepy to me, so. All right, so we visualize information. We represent it as visual information because for many of us, uh, some more than others, we can really grasp a visual metaphor much more easily than we can complicated table like I showed you earlier, right? So many of you probably looked at that complicated table and just kind of gave up on it. You didn't even try to interpret it. But a visualization like this where we talk about our familiar trope of data information presentation knowledge, this is different, right? This shows you the same information we've been talking about in a slightly different way that might improve your understanding of what's going on. So it makes data not just what we think of as factual and repeatable, but also persuasive, right? And a good reason why many people share information with one another is to persuade each other of what the state of the world really is. So we have two main methods by which we can take information and turn it into a visual format. And those two methods, we'll go over different examples of each for the rest of this section. One example is through data visualization. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, which, uh, 
So we automatically generate, uh, da take data that, that is uh, available in big databases or data sets, and then you use a computer program of some sort to create an image or some sort of graph out of that. The other that you've seen most often on Pinterest is the information graphic, which is where you take a complex thing, a narrative story more, and what you do is you basically draw a story. Uh, it's not automatically generated, it's designed to kind of demonstrate what it means. So like this is an information graphic, right? We didn't automatically generate these images. What happened is somebody thought this particular set of images was related to the topic at hand. All right, so infographics that are illustrations of information designed by some group of people to, to be able to highlight a story or to tell a narrative of some sort. One of the people that you looked at for today was a TEDx talk by a buddy of mine, Carl Goode, who used to be the information graphics designer for Newsweek. And that was his job, right? Newsweek and those news magazines, this is what they do a lot, is they're trying to explain complicated things to a general population. So they have these types of infographics, like this one that Carl created, that tried to explain a complex set of things through basically the art of illustration. This is another one that he did, trying to show how bird flu moves across the population of the world, right? So you can see it's designed to fit in a two-page spread of a magazine, you know, it's set for the format. It takes information from, uh, you know, epidemic stuff. You can see kind of the, the numbers he's using and the data, but it uses uh, kind of visualization to make it more persuasive and more compelling to look at. Another guy who really has been a key mover and shaker in the field of information graphics is Edward Tufte. Anybody heard of this guy? Tufte is famous in the world of information graphics. He's the guy everybody feels guilty about when their slides look ugly. Um, he basically talks about beautiful evidence, right? We've talked a lot in this class about evidence and how you know, we use data and information to build evidence around factual claims. Edward Tufte makes a claim that information is more persuasive and more compelling when it's beautiful, not just factual, right? So he goes through a lot of effort to create different types of graphics or show what other people have done that's persuasive and beautiful. So this particular graphic, which comes out of one of his books, is a famous one. Um, I have a, a framed poster of it in my office, actually. It is uh, basically the markings over time of one of the Russian space capsules as it moves across the, around and around the Earth. Somebody makes little notations. And so this is basically a table and a graph made by cosmonauts as they sat in space for quite a while, right? Um, and you can see it, it is just a, a graph and it's just a visualization of kind of where they were in, in relationship to the Earth over time, but it's also kind of a compellingly beautiful piece of, of history and of information that it kind of draws the eye. Another one that he points to as being famous um, was, was made a long time ago, and this shows the march of Napoleon both to Waterloo and back from it, right? So the, thic the thickness of the line is his, basically the size of his army, and it's moving, you can see, in, in, uh, over to uh, Russia, and then it's marched back. So you can see at the starting point, the dark line shows where his army size was uh, at the end of the march, and it's obviously, they got decimated, right? You can see that as they, their army got smaller and smaller as they got closer to Russia, and on the way back, they barely survived, and, they, and barely a group of them made back. So why can't we just show some numbers, right? Napoleon had, you know, 100,000 troops when he left France. He only had 2,000 troops when he returned. What's different about this? Yeah, just saying it isn't beautiful, right? It also obscures a lot of important information. You know, you missed a longitudinal story. What this information graphic does is it shows you that change over time that is often very hard to do with statistics or with kind of just numerical data. So this shows you uh, multiple types of information all bundled into one particular presentation, right? And that's also a strength of information graphics as opposed to statistics or just other types of written narratives. It basically bundles lots of information into one representation. Cool? This one is, oh, what is this one again? I believe this is a history of rock and roll. Uh, so this shows kind of the interrelationships and the longitudinal origin of subgenres of popular music over time, right? So it kind of like shows you how these are layered and which bands are associated with which ones. It's just a way of taking, 
you know, we've all kind of seen these visualizations before, kind of history of rock, what these things look like, you know, how uh, uh, music evolves over time. So those are some tufty ones, but information graphics have become big business. It's actually been a little remarkable over the past three or four years how much information graphics have become a big deal, right? And how people try to represent data in different ways. And there's actually a lot of growth in this field. As many of you know, for the boss quest coming up, one of the options that you have for uh, accomplishing the boss quest is to do two information graphics. Um, and these things have been really, really popular. Actually, this one's no good. I'm going to show you a couple. So uh, there's actually a book coming out. Uh, where is it? So there's actually a book coming out, uh, and I would have assigned it for this class, but it's just coming out. Uh, that's basically Best American Infographics. So I'm going to show you kind of their video a second. So one of the videos they showed that I thought was interesting was the carbon emissions in New York City. Oh, I guess we can nah, screw that. I don't want to watch their advertisement. So um, you know, one of the things I like about information graphics is that they do take really complicated things and make them understandable at a glance. Um, and it does require a set of skills that haven't been commonly produced in our educational system up to now, right? So you do need a blend of storytelling and graphic design and the ability to understand and manage data that is a rare enough set that there's a ton of economic opportunity in the field of making information graphics. Uh, I don't do them because I have absolutely zero artistic talent whatsoever. Like whatever the negative of artistic talent is, that's what I have. Same with my musical talent. Like just sarcasm, sarcasm is close to that, yeah. That's my only art form is weirdness. So. Um, so information graphics are great, and, and now we're making more and more kind of complicated ones. One of the ones I wanted to show you, oh, I don't, did I have it here? Hold on a second. They, the, one of the ones they kind of briefly showed in there was, no, hold on, I can search for it real quick. The New York City carbon emissions.
That's obviously way too clean and nice to be real New York City. New York. So how is that different than just telling you that in one year New York City will generate, I don't know, 340, 50 million metric tons of carbon emission or carbon dioxide emissions? Yeah. And why did you laugh? Yeah, right? It's, it's a visual representation that changes an abstract number to something that's more concrete, right? Anybody else have a reaction to the video like, or that, that visualization of it? Yeah, you, we don't understand what 340 million actually looks like, right? Like we, our brains just aren't wired to actually consider a number that size. So visualization can help us when our poor primate brains let us down by showing us basically what that would look like in some other format. So there are a ton of these information graphics. I mean, you can, uh, there's a great site actually uh, where you can look them up. This is one that I really like, which are uh, bad things that happen in the world and the size, how many people die because of those things over time. So like the larger the circle, the worse the thing was, the more people died. And it's divided up along the y-axis into different types of things like civil wars, despots, uh, colonial wars, failed states. U.S. isn't on there yet. I don't think they've updated that for, for us. But like you can see like how many people died in uh, Mao Zedong's uh, uh, purges versus uh, the fall of the Ming Dynasty versus mid, uh, the, the midi slave trade, you know. So it just kind of shows you, like, you know, how awesome we are as a species. All in one, easy to read, comparable, right? Because the interesting thing here is that this is a comparable graphic. I can compare how this particular event looked at to compare it to the next one. XKCD has, a, for a long time, many of you probably know XKCD. How many of you don't know XKCD? Don't admit that. It's a, I'm just kidding. It's a, uh, a web comic that does a lot of geek and science culture. And they will often do uh, uh, visualizations like this, right, to show a particular issue. This one's the electromagnetic spectrum, showing people what the EM spectrum is. And they have some jokes in here and things. But it really is a pretty good representation of the different bands within the electromagnetic spectrum. One of the other ones they, liked, they did that I really liked was the narratives of different nerd movies. So you can kind of see the different narrative comparison of, of Lord of the Rings and kind of the rich interplay of characters in Lord of the Rings compared to what you would see in Star Wars or Jurassic Park 
or their joke one, 12 Angry Men, uh, you know. And then another one they did that I really like is all 786 known planets to scale, right? So the, they have a little box around our solar system just to show how small and insignificant even the big planets in our solar system are compared to kind of the range of giant planet sizes that are out there. And you know, it's, it's a quick, easy, fun visualization. A planet of planets, all comparable, all showing you quite a bit of information in one easily consumed kind of amuse-bouche of uh, information, right? So this is what information graphics do, is they try to take uh, complex pieces of information or information that somebody thinks is compelling but hasn't been presented in a compelling way and tries to get you to look at that data in, or information in a new way. There are certain types of information graphics that are really common and popular, even amongst uh, people who don't do kind of the professional or, or really kind of cool ones like that. So, you know, a uh, periodic table of something, uh, comparing heights of something, uh, pie charts are a type of information graphic, of course, uh, maps, uh, clusters of words, we'll see another example of that, uh, bar graphs, any type of graph, of course, is a visual, is an information graphic, right? Or actually it's an information visualization that you can use. Um, in terms of thinking about your own information graphics that you might do for your quests, notice that a lot of the ones I showed you are hand drawn, right? Like a lot of the, the XKCD ones were all drawn freestyle by hand. An information graphic and some of the more compelling ones actually can be hand drawn. They don't have to necessarily be generated by a crazy amount of data. So one of the ones they blew through, like when their birth date's the most common, is a really uh, popular infographic that you see a lot of times. This one's just hand drawn. Should I check email? Right? Is life good? This is a simple but straightforward information graphic. Number of deaths in Breaking Bad. This one I thought was interesting, which is kind of a uh, breakdown of phenotypes of different types of dogs and how much of the phenotype each breed of dog has in them. Paths through New York City. Right? Planets, artists, fruits. I mean, you can see like, Information graphics, information visualizations have been used to cover pretty much any topic that's been out there. And here's an info, infographic of infographics. You knew it had to be coming, right? Um, that's something we make an infographic of infographics. And it does show kind of, you know, uh, average number of times people read an infographic, different color schemes, what are the base colors people use. So it's a nice breakdown of different methods people have tried with different infographics. One of the, the, the kind of design sites listed what I thought were a pretty sensible set of rules for making infographics and things that any infographic designer should keep in mind. So for instance, planning and sketching them out as opposed to just diving right in. Uh, knowing when to keep it simple. Most information graphics break down when they try to add too many things. Uh, most of the really bad ones try to do too much. Simple ones are better. Uh, telling a story through the organization of the material on the page. An information graphic, don't ever forget, is a compelling information narrative, right? It's a story you're telling in one piece. Uh, being clever and humorous, keeping the purpose and tone in mind. Uh, and then as they say, using different typography is lazy information graphics, right? So if all you're doing with an infographic is saying something in text but using crazy Comic Sans font to do it or whatever, that's not really infographics. So keep that in mind. Any questions so far on infographics? This was four slides ago. Oh wait, I do, with lecture tools we can just look it up, never mind. I gave it away. All right, six is enough.
Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Everybody in? Everybody good? Feeling strong? Feeling solid? Close enough? Oh. I wouldn't say the, major the majority of the class didn't get it right, but that was the mod modal response at least. So yeah, uh, um, neither information visualization or information graphics require professional designers. Like I showed you, you can hand draw a visualization or just use relatively simple uh, uh, visual elements and create a compelling information graphic. Uh, information viz is more narrative based. Well, we haven't really talked about that, so it's not really a fair question. But no, you know, both uh, information graphics really is the narr more narratively based um, uh, tool. But as we talked about in that last slide a few ago, uh, information visualizations are automatically generated by data as opposed to being drawn by a designer. So let's actually, oh, I did have that video in here. That's where it went. So let's talk about information visualizations as a separate genre uh, distinct from information graphics. So like I said, information visualizations are automatically generated by data. And we'll talk about how they get generated in a second. Um, they typically are trying to show hidden patterns in complex relationships of data. So they're often used to show prevalence or to show relationships or things that would be hard to understand if you just looked at simple correlates or, or kind of boiled down statistics. One of the problems with inferential statistics, the, the type that I described to you earlier with my nice table, that beautiful table from the beginning of class, is that it was designed in an era with small data, and consequently, big data breaks it, right? Most of the statistics that we have been trained, training ourselves to use over the past 100 years, they break down in the face of very large data. So sometimes, to show relationships, we really are dependent on these types of visualizations. Um, so the pro main problem with doing information visualization is actually getting access to data. And what data are you going to use? And then what software will you use to represent it? So we're going to talk about some of those effects. All right, so a couple of very common systems. One is geographic information systems, or GIS. Have you heard this term before? GIS is a big deal, uh, especially for urban planning and for people who do a lot of uh, kind of thinking about geographic spaces, right? So this is a map. Uh, in LA of the density of uncredentialed teachers uh, in that area, right? So what does this tell you? Why would this map be important? Well, if I'm thinking of moving to LA, it might tell me what neighborhood I might want to avoid, right? So people take data sets like this and are able to overlay it, uh, these maps and do really complicated and sophisticated kinds of relationship showing to show different types of views of physical spaces. We'll show, see a couple more in a second. Maps.google.com allows you to build some of these uh, very simple GISs on your own. There are very sophisticated, very costly programs that allow you to do GIS. Uh, and most cities and governments have GIS specialists who work for them. But it's very easy to also just go to maps.google.com and uh, start layering your own types of um, GIS systems. Another really common uh, type of visualization is social network diagramming, right? So social network diagramming basically takes people and tries to visualize the relationships between people. So this is a famous one made by a colleague of mine, Lada Adamic, and her colleague, Nata Glant, uh, Natalie Glantz. And what this is, is these are uh, liberal blogs and conservative blogs, right? Are the dots, blue dots for liberal, red dots for conservative. And what the lines represent are times the blogs referenced another blog, right? So you can see liberal blogs reference liberal blogs a lot, and conservative blogs reference conservative blogs a lot, but those yellow lines where they cross over, there's not as many of those, right? So what does this tell us? Well, the way people often interpret this is filter bubble, right? That people uh, with opposing viewpoints aren't really talking to one another. And you guess what this social network is? These are my Facebook friends, right? Or at least my Facebook friends a couple years ago. Now notice, what do the clusters mean? 
Yeah, people who know each other. Not just that I know them, but they also know each other. And each cluster is typically represented by a grouping. So this cluster down here on your lower left, that's you, probably Michigan State people, right? The cluster over here is probably University of Michigan people. And then upstairs, I have my high school friends, my furry club, and <laughs> I mean, uh, Lions Club. Is that the right one? All right, so there are people who are really good at this. Like I said, I am not really good at visualization, but there are people who are excellent at this and have really driven this field for a large number of years. So let's go through a couple of these folks uh, and look at some of their work. So one famous guy is Hans Rosling, who is um, kind of an urban planner. This is like urban, like uh, public health, urban planning. He thinks about big data sets quite a bit, and he's done some really compelling work looking at visualization to look at population level data. Uh, and he has a very compelling video kind of where he does a lot of that. So it's worth spending the four and a half minutes to look at that video. How many of you have seen this before? Now, I'm going to try to Quite a few of you. All right, well watch it again, damn it, and shut up. Whoa, too much. Hi, right, everybody. Come on, Internet. In China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor in Lang province of Guayshou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural part 
So the numbers, though, disappear, right? And as he is showing, like there's an aggregation that happens with these visualizations that we really do have to keep in mind. So we'll talk more about that in a second. So Hans Rosling, uh, th with this video that made its way around social media quite a bit a couple of years ago, really showed the power of these visualizations to show these population-wide and, and very complicated types of effects. Um, another one of my favorites is Mark Newman uh, here at the University of Michigan in the physics department who does a lot of these maps. And a couple of these we looked at when we talked about uh, um, maps previously. But this, for instance, is just a typical map of who voted for whom in one of the last elections, right? Uh, and the blue represents, you know, states that went for a Democrat and the reds will go for a state that went for a Republican. And by looking at this, you would imagine that the United States is a completely kind of divided country. Um, you know, you'd also imagine that for some reason having shoreline increases your chances of being a democratic uh, stronghold for some reason. But what Mark is able to show through some of his cartograms is that it's actually a much more complicated story, right? So when you start to look at people's voting outcomes by population of the areas where they live, this giant swath of people in the middle part of the country shrink in terms of their total relevance compared to the actual population of the United States, right? And those blue areas, part of the reason they go uh, democratic is because water collects population, right? So having a shoreline does seem to be important because shorelines attract big population centers that tend to vote a specific way. When he breaks the, that cartogram down even more at the district level as opposed to at the state level, you can see, does this country look as divided as the one we saw in the first map? No. It shows that actually there are people of all inclinations living all over the country, right? And that really we're much more purple than we are red and blue. Now this is an important distinction because most of the maps that you see presented in mainstream media, I can't believe I just said mainstream media, but in the mass media, uh, really uh, to simplify show you just that first map, right? They're not going to show you a map like this because this might be in hard to, for you to interpret. Um, another favorite of mine is Fernanda Viegas. She worked quite a bit. Her uh, dissertation work at uh, uh, MIT was basically doing these information visualization systems. So this one was basically uh, uh, chats, right? So this is a chat visualizer showing in a discussion form. Each color represents a different speaker. The x-axis re represents the change in content over time. You know, and it shows basically the life cycle of a chat thread in Usenet, I think is what she used. And I think we saw this one when we looked at Wikipedia, right? She used this visualization to represent what does the life cycle of a Wikipedia article look like. So at a glance, you can see one Wikipedia article. And this one is evolution, I think. And so you can see the change. Each color represents a different contributor to the evolution article. The x-axis represents the time in which she studied it. And the y-axis re represents the total amount of information. So in one simple graphic, she is showing you three variables tied together and how they interrelate with one another, right? This would be data that would be very hard to represent in a numerical format. Her colleague and a person she had a company with, uh, they worked at IBM for a while, I think now they might be at Google, uh, Martin Wattenberg, uh, did a bunch of work looking at, for instance, tree maps. This is known as a tree map. Uh, and it basically tracks uh, sectors in the stock market and which sectors are receiving the most volatility and things like that. So this is a way for investors to see at a glance what are the dynamic changes taking place in the stock market. 
Martin's actually married to a very nice lady named Laura Wattenberg, and Laura writes books about baby names. Uh, so Martin helped her to create what's uh, known as the uh, baby name wizard, and you can go in and you can see how common your name is. And you can see that commonality over time. So with this graph, what you can see are boys and girls, for some reason, named Clifford, my name, over the past 100 years or so. And what you can see is at a certain point in 1900, Clifford was a pretty hot name. And now it's just me and the guy from Cheers, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and the dog, the big red dog. So this is another, again, just a really, it's, a, it's data generated. What they do is they take data from uh, publicly available databases of birth records, uh, and they can show the change in these names over time to see how popular has your name gotten. And names go through very weird particular phases, right? So right now, the most common girl's name that's being assigned is Emma. That is by far the most common girl's name being applied, especially in the Midwest right now. But, you know, 15 to 20 years ago, that name would not have been used very commonly. Um, when I was a kid, the name Peter was really heavily applied. And that's not a name that gets applied very often. Or, um, or Richard or things like that. Fernanda and Martin created a site called Many Eyes, which basically allows you to go in, plug in your own data. They tell you how to, to, to clean up the data and make it ready and to put it into many eyes to visualize in whatever way you want to. Now this is, after, this is owned by IBM, and it's always existed as kind of this beta skunk works by IBM. I don't think they ever made it into a really commercial product. But it's still out there, and there's still a group of users who are heavily invested in it, and it's one of those fun kind of projects that just kind of keeps existing. This is an example of uh, uh, a visualization that they use. This is, I think, a a uh, diagram visualization of basically, uh, what are these? I believe status updates, but I'm not 100% positive. Another guy who does a lot of this is Jeff Hare, uh, who previously at Stanford University, now at the University of Washington. Uh, he creates a very set, uh, strong set of visualizations. Like this is, um, uh, uh, this map basically shows different words that were used in, I think, a syllabus. He has another one, that, uh, a site that is called Sense.us, which takes census data over the past you know, 200 years or so and allows you to show changes, like how many women have worked in construction and how have those numbers changed over time. So similar like the baby name wizard, but allows you to do more uh, across different types of fields as opposed to just names. So preparing data for visualization is the big deal, right? Um, you know, in order to visualize something, you need basically something that you're going to use to visualize the data, but you also need data that you're going to visualize. So here's some things that they recommend that you need to do. Like, so you have to figure out where you're going to get the data. You have to parse it, uh, which means basically providing structure for the data. You have to make sure each field uh, is readable. You have to make sure the data in each field is in a consistent format, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is all basic database management, by the way. Uh, you have to filter out, remove variables not of interest. You have to mine. Uh, the, the interesting patterns that you're going to show in your visualization. So you might do that with correlations or t-tests or something like that. Uh, choose your visualization, revise it, and then give away for users to interact with visualizations. Because the best ones aren't static. You can actually change it and try different things, right? Uh, I'm actually going to take a, oops. So a couple that you can look at and you can follow along on your own computers here. So here's a visualization, for instance, that is pretty simple. It shows what people eat. Green is good, uh, yellow is medium, and uh, uh, red is poor uh, food. And it shows how much of it we eat. And it shows the light band that moves back and forth is the time of day. So in the daytime, uh, in the United States, we eat quite a bit, <laughs> right? But it's usually pretty healthy stuff. And you can compare us with South America here in the daytime. But as nighttime rolls around and Europeans are eating their fruit cups or whatever they eat, oh, something's happening late at night in the United States. <laughs> Our diets change, right? Taco Bell. I need, a, I need one of them Dorito Locos. You know, and Europe has the same effect. Not as bad, but, you know. 
Uh, and then Asia doesn't seem to be affected at all by nighttime. For the, well, that's not true, a little bit. So it's just, this is, again, a very simple visualization, but that uh, JavaScript-y ability to move and control how fast you move that thing creates a new way of interacting with information, right? Another one is the Google Books Ngram viewer that allows you to do different things. So this basically uh, looks at Google Books and looks at words and combination of words. And you can see the prevalence of that word over time in books that are held by this database. So I looked up the word information, for instance. And you can see the growth of the term information in books. For a long time, for 120 years about, there is no change in the use of the word information. But you can see this fairly drastic increase in the use of the word information over time, right? Some words that you can see like just, just are more vogue. People never used to use the word awesome until at a certain point, suddenly a huge group of people were using the term awesome. Right? So it's just a way of tracking. It's an interactive way of tracking trends. It's a visualization of a really large data set that you can use. Another one is Google Trends that you can use, same type of thing. You can see what people are searching for. But they also have this very cool kind of uh, interactive, ongoing you know, search thing. You can see basically what are people searching for uh, in real time with this type of kind of visualization. I actually don't know what the colors mean. I didn't think to look that up. Any surprises there? It's a little depressing, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I wish somebody were looking up like how to get the government going again, but <laughs> that's okay. It's all right. So there are lots of tools that will allow you to do your own visualizations of different types, right? So uh, Fidget is an open source tool that allows you to take data in different formats, clean it up, insert it, and make different types of information visualizations. Um, Gephi uh, is an open source tool that does social network analysis and allows you to create quite pretty, quite gorgeous social network uh, visualizations. Um, Node Excel is another one that works with Microsoft Excel on Windows at least. And the nice thing about Node Excel is that you can, uh, for instance, put in a Twitter hashtag and it will automatically download tweets related to that hashtag and show you the social network of people who have been tweeting with that hashtag. So it's a really good, fun way of doing quick and dirty visualizations of social network graphs or social graphs as they sometimes call them in these uh, social media sites. It's also open source, even though it's an Excel product. The guy who created it, Mark Smith, um, uh, who's a super smart, great guy, tried to get them to include it automatically in, in Excel when he was at Microsoft, but they wouldn't do it, so they just released it as an open source add-on to Excel. One you might have used just for high school projects is Wordle, right? You put in a, a big chunk of text, and it will show you a Wordle like this. That's just, this is the one for our syllabus, actually. Um, it just shows you the kind of prevalence of different words in a text, in a, in a block of text uh, type of thing. Crazy Egg is a system you can use that's uh, kind of a software as a, a service model. Uh, you can go in and put in data sets and it will give you uh, different types of visualizations you can use. Uh, some of those we just looked at. All right, so some issues with visualizations that you should be aware of, right? <coughs> One thing is that visualizations can be very misleading. So when we looked at that, hot, that Rosling video, one of the things he did is he took the map of China, right, that was aggregated, and he pulled out different, I mean, China's a huge, really heterogene heterogeneous uh, populated country. So he choose, took out little provinces out of China and showed how there are these hugely different outcomes for the different provinces in China, right? You could do the same thing in the United States. If you took Michigan away from California, we are two entirely separate economies and, and two different outcomes. So by their nature, sometimes these 
uh, visualizations can aggregate data in such a way as to misinform or to mislead. So you have to be very careful of them and you have to be a savvy consumer of them. They're very hard to do correctly, right? People who make very good visualizations are wizards and I admire them greatly. Not many people can do them very well. It's a true art form. And in the, in the School of Information, for instance, we teach at least two master's classes that are entirely about how to make good, compelling visualizations. You know, it's, it's a very hard thing to do. Um, and sometimes they're just overly simplistic, right? The thing I like about my table of numbers at the beginning of the lecture is that it actually has a lot of detailed, sophisticated data in it that a, uh, a trained observer could see a lot more information than if I just drew that as a line, right? Here's an example of one of those bad infographics or bad visualizations. I mean, the mix of colors and what, what, you know, what am I supposed to interpret out of each of these and they're mixing too many variables. So it's really easy to take one of these things and have it to go wrong and to make it more obfuscating than enlightening. Uh, what's, can anybody spot the problem with this information graphic? The scale. The scale, right? When you just look at it, it looks like, holy shit. Clinton was way cooler than Bush, right? Or no, not cooler. But when you look at the actual number differences and you look at the scale of 5.175 versus 5.21, what are you really comparing there, right? So this is a common uh, trick for undergraduates to make their, dis their data look more compelling. And then our brains sometimes just don't react well to different sizes, like the, the number of uh, the number discordance with the size of the bubble, our brain is hardwired to think that the bigger bubble is more significant, right? Even though we realize, oh, wait a second, it's actually the smaller thing. It's very easy to mislead people through the representation of these information graphics. So, you know, be very uh, careful and savvy consumers of these things. They can be misleading, but at the same time, they're incredibly powerful and they're great ways to but especially for people who have limited attention and you're trying to capture that attention, they can be really compelling, really effective ways to uh, show information in a persuasive way. So next time we will be talking more about uh, infer user interface design and new types of user experiences. Uh, and I hope to see you Thursday. <laughs>